Hello and welcome to track two of the Festival of Creative Operations 2022. I'd like to introduce your chair for this track, Jim Hubbard, the CEO of WDC. Jim, thanks for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. And welcome everybody to track two of the Festival of Creative Operations for our fascinating next presentation, Scaling the Creative Director Role with Charles Duncan from Omnicom Critical Mass. Charles is a creative technologist who spent 15 years with Disney working in various roles um, from publishing to licensing, Imagineering, ESPN Disney Plus, and finally in retail. Uh, today, he's now working at Omnicom Critical Mass as the technical director of creative operations creative automation. Uh, during this session, Charles will share with us how to edit multiple assets at the same time to drive new forms of creative expression across your business. And just before I hand over to Charles, just a reminder, please don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box at, at any point uh, during the presentation. Um, so thank you very much and over to you Charles. All right thanks Jim. All right we've got a lot to get through today so uh, let's get right into it. Um, today is about scaling your role and uh, scaling our creative. Um, so if you want to follow along for free today uh, I would recommend going to optica.com that's with two k's there's a sign up button here optica.com you're going to probably want to get in there and uh, be able to hand touch some assets and apply some uh, changes at scale yourself to get a get a feel for that uh, a little bit about me i'm a uh, as jim said creative technologist i've spent a lot of money in this space i've um, built uh, some of the largest creative supply chains on earth uh, i have a slight visual impairment which uh, always brings me sympathetic to those people who have trouble with uh, visualization and uh, explains a little bit about why I'm so fascinated about the space of um, helping us create content. <clears throat> we're gonna be talking a little, we're mostly gonna be talking over here today on the content creation side. And uh, just to provide some context, the way I view pipelines is there's when you create content and then when you enrich and distribute and make money off of content. And there's this transformation gap in the middle. And this is a, where a lot of us struggle today. But um, in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of great breakthroughs on technology to help us automate um, some of our creative output. Uh, and a lot of this, I just want to point out, is business enrichment when we're creating ads or creating experiences or um, anything where we're assembling content to basically for business purposes. But today, we're going to be on the left side of where the bulk of your um, world is. So let's start with um, uh, the NFL. So if you can picture yourself being tasked with something like this, something as large as the NFL, it's, it's one of the largest um, sporting events in the world. You got 32, uh, uh, 32 franchises. And then a lot of what um, happens on events is actually post game outcome. So where two teams meet and there's a winner and a loser and that affects kind of the tournament or whatever. And a lot of merchandise is sold around this. So if you look at what's going on into the content delivery that you're going to have to account for is you've got light and dark mode. We're going to personalize this stuff and we've got location services. So if you think about what's what are opportunities at play here is the ability to have light and dark content um, location services, meaning that we can almost uh, put somebody in a city and maybe uh, associate them with a particular team. And then that allows us to drive personalization. And then down in the right corner here is the often forgot about uh, accessibility experience. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking about that in the past. I'm not gonna touch so much on that today, but I always wanna call out that when we're looking at how we customize our experience, we also wanna account for people with visual impairments. So let's think about how we go about tackling this. We're going to have the Super Bowl. We're gonna have an outcome. We wanna make sure that our business flows towards that outcome, whether or not we're spinning out products or um, branding our website to celebrate some sort of team victory. And so if you think about it, you know we gotta plan way ahead, uh, time to market maybe eight months because we're gonna create content. We gotta staff up and do all this robust security because we don't want anybody seeing our content before the event. Um, maybe uh, try to forecast what the probable outcomes of teams winnings are. 
and, uh, and then maybe spinning out tons and tons of variants using some sort of automation machine. But that is not it. That is not the way we do this anymore. This is the way we used to do this about three years ago. And so we don't have to go down these roads anymore. This is where a lot of automation starts coming in to help us to where we can produce content at runtime. We can produce content on the outcome of a particular game. And so that's where we start looking into things like robotics. <clears throat> So I'm going to play a video here of robotics sitting on top of Optica. And what you're watching is um, the ability to start siphoning content either from a repository or your desktop and having that content start to be processed and prepped for what we call centralized creative director control. Um, this tool is basically going through and cataloging all of the uh, primitives that are coming into it and normalizing that content so that as the creative director, you can start applying uh, common styles or branding across an entire swath of uh, content and being able to publish that. And if you think about what's what you're watching right now, it's like how many times have you had to go in and do some of this stuff by hand? Remember, we're talking about brand level pieces. We're talking about when you're making money off a brand, you have to have consistency across the look. You're going for a particular style and all of those things. So let's talk a little bit about what's, what's happening in the UI right now. <clears throat> On the left side, you basically have your ability to grab and um, designate content types. So say like you wanna look at a particular conference uh, within the NFL, or you wanna grab a certain personality type of uh, a demographic, okay? So a lot of this on the left is how we can start to tee up our business case. On the right side is a place where we have our, our, our familiar creative controls. So this looks a lot like Photoshop over here. It behaves a lot like Photoshop. You have all your blend modes and uh, ability to do opacity and all of those things. Um, and then up here in the center is where you start to apply style and where you start to be able to change out colors, apply textures and do all of those, those things. And we'll, um, we'll look at that here in a second. But just to finish up, what you're, what you're looking at is not sped up video. This is robotics sitting on top of the UI in order for us to get content in and normalize it. So I'm gonna actually pause this and go back. Like if you look at like some of these variations here, there's this color book angle right here where we're trying to get to where we can normalize, meaning we, could, we kind of fit the dynamic control within a certain box so that it becomes predictable. And so this, when you apply them to all, you can kind of see or get a sense for, doesn't this kind of feel like a coloring book? It's like, the, it starts to become the impetus of how we're starting to build out any particular commonality between all of them. And so if I fast forward a little bit later, you can start to see here where we then start to add textures and dimensionality to these things. And then you can start to see now we're going into some dark modes and we're starting to pound out more variations that will enable us to have our dark mode variation that we talked about at the beginning. A lot of this is a lot about lighting, as you guys know. Um, but think about all the preparation going into this step right now so that you don't have to do that, so that you're teeing up uh, the creative director so that the creative director can come in and apply you know, controls and maps. And then finally, I'm gonna bounce forward a little bit more to the end of this video. You can start to see um, there's shading being applied right there. So you've got your lighting, fine, fine amount of light there at the top. And then finally, we're gonna to start to see some um, painted in textures. Um, right there, you've got a stroke. I'm hoping that comes through on the video. But we're, we're now applying shading, okay? Creating a light source shading and i'm going to fast forward a little bit like here and start pausing here and now that the whole thing that we were upstream and normalizing is enabling us to get to this moment where we can start to create what looks like hand painted textures there is no human beings that was involved up to this point 
as you can start to see when we're putting out textures like this. And all of this is just providing our primal, uh, primordial elements that we're going to hand to the creative director to then create stylistic variations. And so again, you might want to log into Optica today because you can um, get your hands on this and kind of experience firsthand what it's going to be like to uh, pull some of these levers on the side. All right. <clears throat> so now we've we've um, teed ourselves up to where we have what we call coloring books or or starting points. So on the left, you can see a dark mode that's using kind of like a a glowing light effect, right? On the right side is basically a light source uh, creating shadows. So a good good seated place for you to start as a creative director looking at. Um, how you want to start uh, texturizing this brand or providing some sort of experience around this brand. So if you, um, by the way, I'm going to show this one more time. If you want to come in and join and get your hands on it, optica2ks.com, there's a sign up button right here. Okay, that's going to land you in the vicinity of this. These are public galleries. Uh, gallery is a stylistic abstraction that enables you to separate the brand style away from your creative assets so that you can, um, every new asset that you're throwing in becomes styled according to the brand. But today I want you to drop into this right here. It's a calligraphy. Um, it's a good example, pretty, pretty simple example. But so if you log in, you're gonna see this tile, <clears throat> click on this tile. It's gonna take us into our gallery like this. And so um, you should be seeing like these four tiles on the screen. And uh, let's walk around the UI a little bit here. So on the left, you'll see that we've got layers. And at this point, there's really only one layer because these are just a single layer file across the board, right? But if you click in over here, you can see that there's all these styles that have been made available. So if we pivot this, we go into a dark style. And notice how it's applying the colorization, right? It's very similar to like a Illustrator file. However, this is all rasterized graphics. These are not uh, vector-based graphics. And then if you click something like the third style, now we start to start to pull in a little bit more of the color pieces. And so you'll notice now that all of a sudden we have more layers starting to come up. And so, um, the concept here is that all of these assets share the same layer definition and those roll up and that's why you have the counts here you see the backlight we've got four layers so if you click on this backlight color over here you can slide select opacity and then start moving this around and you'll see a subtle it's very subtle well, let me just do something a little bit more overt <clears throat> just something like this and so if you come in, you can grab these, take down the opacity, or even turn up the blur. Down here, there's a blur. And you can see that you're going to blur all of them out at the same time. You see that? Again, this is where you get centralized, creative, director-level control across the entire brand. And then... Um, also to ground you a little bit, like say if you just want to touch one, like say one of them isn't conforming, you just click on this button over no, here to the right. And that brings up your traditional uh, Photoshop layer control. You're just affecting this one particular layer. So I'm just going to turn the backlight off so you can see that. So you get the best of both worlds. You can um, touch everything in mass or you can get in and start tweaking things at the individual le uh, level. Coming up here to your uh, stylistic controls, um, you can go in and basically uh, grab a color and start changing the entire color variation that's happening here. And then um, really, the question is, well, well, how do you get to this particular point? So there's two ways to, to get started. Um, if we go back up here, um, there will be a start trial button up here where you can create your own galleries and get started. And then once, once you do that, you're going to end up in something like a blank gallery like this. 
And there's two, there's two ways you can go about doing this. So you can take a PNG file. I'm gonna pull in what we had earlier. This is just a PNG file and you hit upload. It creates your uh, single layer uh, asset right here. And then if you click that, that's the, that's the layered file that you're used to, okay? But you can also drag in uh, Photoshop files. And this is where it gets a little uh, finicky because just because you can pull in an entire Photoshop file, you still wanna be very co conscious of what kind of Photoshop files you're pulling in. These are two Photoshop files, okay? And they have uh, seven and eight layers each. So you really wanna be conscious of how you're feeding layers in. And when we import those, it's going to be looking for commonality between them because we want to end up where we have shared layers across everything. So if we take our this, this back of this flat here and we can kind of move that in and out, right? So you can see that. And so um, a lot of this is based on actually color palettes, okay? So here you've got a primary color, you've got a secondary color. That's where it's getting these up here. So if you click this, it's, it's adhering to web principles. It's using CSS. So in the styling of this particular uh, gallery, it's using a primary color. It's using a secondary color. It's using an accent, things of that nature. So you don't ever come in to Optica specifying a color in a pixel level. You want to, you're specifying masks. You're creating masks and you're unifying them at the same time so that they can respond to the web, which is basically styled with CSS. And then that allows you to conform to the delivery mechanism that you're in, right? You're building out a, uh, a website, right? You're not gonna operate in isolation. Your digital experience is gonna be in the, con in the context of something. So in that, you're going to have CSS styling that outer shell. And so what Optica do is it's preparing you, it's preparing your graphics to listen to those stylizations that are coming in so that you can um, conform to the style of the given web page while still having all this creative control to be able to manipulate that. And then at the end of this, there's a button here that just, you can export your comp right here. And that's gonna spit out the variation that you just had. And so it looks a little something like that. And yes, I know that's like, not that great of a graphic. You could call it hideous graphic, whatever. Um, that's just illustrating what's going on. All right, uh, so we talked about the, the color, um, the coloring books, let's talk a little bit about um, compositions and elements here. So if we go into something a little bit more complicated where we're gonna have some characters, so you can picture this as science fiction characters, same principles going on here. Move this up a little bit. Where we wanna start targeting ethnicity, right? We want to start targeting demographics. By the way, I, I realize this for some people, this is extremely controversial. It's ridiculous. There's an extreme amount of composition going in here, compositing between these two variables. Are, um, so there's a lot of shading going on. Uh, there is a lot of stylization happening from a creative perspective that goes into something like this. You can see how many layers are being dynamically called in order to render something for a demographic. And by the and I think for some of you, if you start getting into multi-demographic uh, artistic creation, it's actually extremely challenging and fun. Um, and it's been fun to actually create the tools around pivoting ethnicity of characters. But when you look at things like this, you can start to get into what are all the different combinations of comps going on. So let me go out to something that's maybe a little bit more uh, fun here. Um, uh, I think it's this. So as you build up your all your layers and your composites, you'll notice that you start ending up with things like elements. So you've got all of these elements that are going on or being pulled in. These are the things we start we saw at the beginning. These are basically your layers broken out. And then you've got all your comp variations that you've built. 
This is your dynamic styling that you're seeing all side by side. All of this, by the way, is still completely controllable by your palettes. So you can still get a cross section. What's going on? Notice how, notice how everything is inheriting the color styles that is happening. And sometimes things look good and sometimes they don't, but this is how you get yourself into this world. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Like this is, you, if you look at what's going on with these AI generated art machines and um, automation tools such as uh, Seltra and Chili Publish and Cloudinary and all those things is like the hand touching that goes on in the creative world today is quickly becoming a thing of the past. You really have to start thinking in terms of dynamicism. You really have to start thinking in terms of how you're going to serve your client at scale, how you're going to get your content in a creative director's hands to where they can touch all of it. Because if you're running around opening Photoshop files one by one today and saving those out, those days are really quickly evaporating away. Um, so that's why you're seeing this, this trend line going in this direction pretty heavily. And um, the best way to get your head around what's happening is to start thinking in terms of primitives. So what is the root, what is the base uh, shape that you have going on? What are those masking layers? What is, what is the key part of your composite that is going to be dynamic, okay? And from there on, you have to also start thinking about baselining. How can you get your entire collection of your brand into a conformed like a uh, frequency space so that when you start applying textures and, and um, all your stylistic variations, that it is predictable, right? And um, when, you, when you start to do that, that's when you really get your uh, head around how to scale and how to start to reach out and create all of these uh, incredibly dynamic, rich experiences where you start to see the commonality between them. Like if we look at this a little bit, right? You, you have this gradient going on in the background. Are you really putting a gradient in every single Photoshop file you've got going on? Like you shouldn't be doing that. And then you could see like this style, this tiling going on around the edge is like a frame. This is all computer generated stuff. You don't need to be going into every Photoshop file and again, doing those things anymore. And so when you start to look at it that way, you can see these commonalities. Like look at this, look at these right two graphics right here and the similarities between the bottom right corner with the noise in the background and these light effects. Like those are applied across, across the collection. You don't need to put that stuff inside the, the Photoshop file anymore. It's a waste of time to be doing that. You're not scaling yourself. And you're putting yourself in a position to where you can't change, to where you cannot flex. And that's the worst place to be from a business perspective. I've built some very large supply chains and change happens. Markets shift. And so you've really got to be on top of making sure that your stuff is flexible and making sure you can respond to what the business needs are. All right. So there's your gallery to play with. Um, so again, what we're doing is we're automating the redundant tasks common to all creative workflow. We're not automating the creation of art. We're automating the redundant tasks that slow you down. And more importantly, what we're doing is we're converting the brand into primitives and normalizing them into an open source language. I'm not going to get into that today, but there's a language underneath all of this, similar to CSS. For you guys who do CSS, it's very similar. But it allows all the downstream tool sets to leverage and build upon that. And then inside of this, we're, we're building query based metadata structures so that we can query rigging. We're basically rigging 2D uh, assets and we're being able to apply uh, programmatic changes to our rigging. rigging. And then right now, um, Optica leverages the DOM, which is the document object model. It's the browser. It's basically all this is running in the browser so that you can have maximum amount of security possible. 
And I won't get into this a little bit too much. You might want to take a screenshot of this. This is just the structure of how you can have an account and control who gets access to your studios, who gets access to your galleries, um, and how you publish content and some of the feature sets that are going on. But it's just kind of giving you a grounding of what's happening in the UI up here. So when you come, when you come here, you have all of the studios you have access to up here. These are all the studios. Everybody's going to see a different list here because you, you won't have that many access, but this is your main studio list. And then when you go inside a particular studio, you're going to see a gallery and a gallery is another way for you to control how people access your content, but it's also the dynamic stylization of it. So then when you go into a gallery, that's where you're starting to apply um, everything in bolt, right? And I know that this looks weird, but that's just because it is in its dynamic native state. Like nothing's been applied to it yet. So that's where you start to then uh, take it. And this is what we saw earlier where you can now render all of it. And then you can start to apply uh, your color variations on top of that. Change out the, the background, the screen, all of those things that you want to do. All right, Jim, I'm wrapping it up. So uh, if there's any questions, um, we'll take that now. Uh, otherwise, uh, good luck. Reach out to me. I am looking for anybody who loves to do tutorials, also looking for people who want to become either creative engineers or design engineers. Right. Thank, thank you very much indeed. That, that was a uh, fascinating insight into uh, new technology. Thank you so much. Um, uh, one question from the floor from uh, Bill Garman is, um, um, could you give us some examples of how uh, this has been used in, in a particular campaign, perhaps, um, and what sort of difference did that make uh, to things like speed to market and um, cost and efficiency and so on? <laughs> that's a great question love that question that's there's a lot there um unfortunately i cannot talk about these things um as much as i wanted to i, I was with disney for 15 years and for the most part couldn't talk about that and so yeah. sadly then when i leave and go to somewhere else all i can do is talk about the past and i can't talk about what i'm doing like right now but here's what here's what i would say here's what i would say to you is um it's a totally great question and, and more importantly what's what i'm interested in is is it actually moving the needle when it comes to somebody making a purchase decision, right? And how you get down to those levels of details. So there's entire infrastructure being spun up around all of that stuff, um, of all of these uh, MarTech companies spinning up um, uh, measurement devices on this, and they're going to this dynamicism. So it already does exist. This already is in, exists, and there are already metrics around all of this stuff. From where I've seen in the industry, the industry is grappling with uh, too many variables right now. There's so many variations. Is the headline in the upper right? What color palette are we using? What was the time of day? All of those particular things lining up is creating massive amounts of data that they're trying to get their head around for the conversion process, right? And that, that to me is inevitable. And the way they're going to get out of that is really just continuing to throw machine learning at that stuff. Machines are great at doing that. So I would say to you, to answer you shortly, uh, I can't get into those specifics, but yes, that is happening, and yes, it is significant, and yes, you should be going down this road because it's just uh, it's it's not gonna you're not gonna stay static anymore. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful indeed, and as I say, a fascinating insight into uh, the sort of leading edge of of um, of Martech. So thanks again, Charles. All right, thank you guys. Feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and all that stuff. All right. Great. Okay. So um, next up in track two, uh, you can hear about how Vacasa stays creative and agile while scaling its brand. In a fireside chat moderated by Frontify. Alternatively, you can navigate back to the agenda tab and join Celtra in track one about the future of creative, how the future of creative production is uh, automated. Uh, so um, I'll see you shortly after that session. Thank you very much again.